Okay, welcome to the class. From today on, we'll spend three lessons to talk about chapter eight, magnetic fields. Today, we're going to have a look at the first lesson, which is about magnets and electromagnets. You probably became familiar with magnets by playing with them when you were a child. You learned that magnets are attracted to some materials, but not to others. In this lesson, we'll learn about magnetic materials and how some of these materials deep inside Earth produce Earth's magnetic field. We'll also learn how the magnetic field surrounds all magnets and how moving electric charges produce a magnetic field. Okay, so first let's have a look at a typical phenomenon resulted from Earth's magnets. Imagine going camping in Northern Canada and on your first night, you look up and see bright greenish white ribbons of light stretching across the night sky. The glowing lights shown in this figure are in motion rippling up and down. So what causes these lights to appear? Why do they move and swirl? The swirls, the swirls of light that you see in the sky are the aurora <coughs> borealis. The same phenomenon in the southern hemisphere is called the aurora australis. One reason these auroras appear is because Earth exhibits the properties of a large magnet. The magnetic field surrounds Earth as if Earth was a bar magnet. Recall from our previous lessons that the magnetic fields are strongest at the poles and that magnetic field lines fan out from Earth's south pole and converge at Earth's north pole. A stream of charged particles called the solar winds escapes the sun's gravity and flows past Earth. The charged particles entering Earth's magnetic field travel in spiral paths along the magnetic field lines towards the poles, where they spiral <coughs> well spiral down the field lines towards Earth's surface. In the upper atmosphere, the charged particles collide with oxygen and nitrogen atoms. These collisions energize the gas atoms. The atoms then release their extra energy as light that we see as the auroras. When you see the lights of the aurora aurelis, you are really watching the interplay of electricity and magnetism. Okay, next, let's have a look at the concept of permanent magnets. The first observations of magnetic fields involved materials that can easily be magnetized, which are called magnet, uh, permanent magnets. Permanent magnets are used in numerous devices, such as compass needles, refrigerator magnets, speakers, and some motors. So here, figure 2a shows a permanent magnet made in the shape of a bar with small iron fillings sprinkled around the bar magnet. The magnetic field of the bar magnet indicated by vector uppercase letter B in this figure is not visible, but the iron fillings follow imaginary lines called magnetic field lines, corresponding to the magnetic field's strength and direction. Figure 2b and c here show how the magnetic fields of two magnets interact with the one the magnets are close together. The poles of a magnet are analogous to positive and negative electric charges. Just as opposite, just as opposite electric charges attract, opposite magnetic poles also attract. 
the North Pole, which you really denote by uppercase letter N, of one magnet attract the South Pole, which is denoted by S, of another magnet. The effect is different, however. When like poles approach each other, two North Poles repel each other, and two South Poles repel each other as well. This is analogous to the way two positive electric electric charges or two negative electric charges repel each other, except that the magnetic poles are electric, electrically neutral. You can see in figure 2a that the ion fillings are crowded together near each pole, right? This crowding indicates that the magnetic field is the strongest at the poles. Magnetic field lines move outward from the north pole of a magnet and inward towards the south pole. Opposite poles attract each other because the magnet magnetic fields are oriented in opposite directions. Like poles repel each other because the magnetic fields are oriented in the same direction. So the attraction and repulsion of magnetic poles explains the alignments of the ion fillings with the magnetic field lines of the bar magnet in figure 2a, which is shown here on top right. Iron is a magnetic material. It produces a magnetic field in response to an applied magnetic field. Each magnetized iron filling has its own north and south poles. The north pole of each iron filling is attracted to the south pole of the large bar magnet and is repelled from the north pole. At the same time, the south pole of an iron filling is attracted to the north pole of the large bar magnet and is repelled from the south pole. This magnetic force calls the iron filling to align parallel to the magnetic field lines and hence parallel to vector B, which is a magnetic field. This is similar to the situation with elect electric dipoles and electric fields, which is shown in figure three here. With an important <clears throat> difference, an electric field can result from a single charge. For example, the electric field of a single positive charge radiates outward from the charge A. However, for a magnetic field, it will always result from a magnetic dipole. This will always be, there will always be a north pole and a south pole producing the magnetic field. You can never have only a south pole or only a north pole. The magnetic field lines of a bar magnet extends from the north pole to the south pole outside the magnet and from south to north inside the magnet, forming a closed loop. Magnetic field lines always form closed loops. You can make a horseshoe magnet by simply bending a bar magnet, which is shown here in figure four, in the bottom right. <laughs> On one end of the house to magnet has a north pole and the other end has a south pole. The field lines form closed loops as they circulate through the house through. The field lines extend across the gap between the ends of the magnet. So the direction of the field is from the north pole towards the south pole, just as it is with a bar magnet. The magnetic field strength is greatest in the gap between the poles. The magnet with horseshoe shoe shapes have many applications, including in motors and generators. Permanent magnets come in many shapes and sizes, regardless of the shape of the magnet, 
the magnetic field lines form closed loops. The field lines point from the north pole towards the south pole, and the field is the strongest at the poles. <clears throat> okay, do you have any questions? Well, if no questions, let's have a look at the Earth's magnetic field. Well, the largest magnet on Earth is Earth itself. A compass needle is a small bar magnet mounted so that it can <clears throat> swive freely about its center, which is shown here in figure 5a. The Earth's magnetic field exerts a torque or twisting force on the magnet. From experiments done with compass needles, William Gilbert, a 16th century English scientist, reasoned that Earth acts as a very large permanent magnet oriented as shown here in figure 5b. Earth has two ge geographic poles, the North Pole and the South Pole, where Earth's axis of rotation meets Earth's surface. Every magnet, including Earth, has two magnetic poles, a North and a South Pole. A compass needle aligns itself to point to the Earth's magnetic poles. Earth's geographic poles are not exactly in the same location as its magnetic poles, but they are close enough that we can say that the North magnetic pole of a compass needle points approximately towards Earth's North geographic pole. This behavior is why the poles of a bar magnet was given the names North and South. Note that the North magnetic pole of one magnet, the, the compass needle, for example, points to the South magnetic pole of a second magnet. So Earth's North geographic pole is actually a South magnetic pole. Right. However, it is convention to refer to the North magnetic pole as Earth's North magnetic pole, even though it's a South pole of a magnet. Okay, be careful with the difference here. <clears throat> okay, so our knowledge what our knowledge of what causes Earth's magnetic field is incomplete so far. But several clues point to an explanation. First, we know that Earth's magnetic poles do not quite coincide with its geographic poles. In fact, Earth's magnetic poles move slowly from day to day and year to year. For centuries, Earth's magnetic south poles were in northern Canada, which is shown in figure six here. In 2011, North magnetic pole were, was located at 84.7 degrees north and 129.1 degrees west, well within the Arctic Ocean, and was moving toward Russia at approximately 60 kilometers per, up per year. Second, geological studies show that Earth's magnetic field has completely reversed direction many times during the planet's history. The last reversal occurred about 780,000 years ago. In the years just before that time, the North Pole of a compass needle would have pointed towards Earth's South magnetic pole. <clears throat> so Earth's currents in Earth's core probably cause this behavior of the magnetic field. Earth's core is made of liquid metal. This liquid conducts electricity and the spin of Earth about its axis causes the liquid to circulate much like the current in a conducting loop. The circulating current causes a magnetic field. Scientists believe that circulation within Earth's core 
has a complicated flow pattern that varies with time. These variations cause changes in the magnetic field, resulting in the movement of Earth's magnetic poles. Scientists still do not have a complete understanding of this phenomenon. However, as is the case with any phenomenon that is not fully understood, more study will take place and scientists' working theories will continue to be modified. We usually think of the regions far above Earth's atmosphere between Earth, the Moon, and the Sun as empty. These regions actually contain many charged particles, including electrons and protons, that come from the Sun or from outside our solar system. Such particles are called cosmic rays. Earth's magnetic field affects these motion. Sorry, Earth's magnet magnetic field affects their motion because they have electric charge. So here, figure seven shows two positive charged cosmic ray particles that approach Earth's equator. A magnetic field exerts a force on charged particle that is perpendicular to both the field and the particle's velocity. Consider the particle on the right in figure seven. At this location, the magnetic field runs parallel to Earth's surface in a geographic south to north direction. The magnetic force on the charged particle points perpendicular to the plane of a drawing and parallel to Earth's surface in a west to east direction. Earth's magnetic field deflects charged cosmic rays near the equator so that they tend to move away from the surface. At the poles, the magnetic field is perpendicular to the surface and much stronger. Cosmic rays spiral along magnetic field lines and at the poles, they spiral downward. The interaction of these cosmic rays with atmosphere atmospherical gases causes the aurora borealis that you read about at the start of our lesson. We will learn about the circular motion of charged particles in the next few lessons, okay? All right, you can take a short break and after that we'll have a look at a new concept called electromagnetism. All right, next let's have a look at electromagnetism. So in 1820, Danish physicist Hans Christian Ostad was demonstrating how a wire becomes warmer when electric charge flows through it. In the course of his de demonstration, he noticed that the needle in nearby compass moved each time he switched on the electricity. This strange event led Ostad to conclude that a magnetic field surrounds moving electric charges. This idea is now known as the principle of electromagnetism. Basically, this principle states that moving electric charges produce a magnetic field. Okay, so next let's have a look at the magnetic field of a straight conductor. Moving charges like those in an electric current produce a magnetic field. Current in a straight wire or other long straight conductor creates a magnetic field whose lines look like circles centered on the wire, which is shown here in figure 8a. You can determine the direction of the magnetic field lines around the straight wire by using the right-hand rule for a straight conductor, which is shown here in figure 8b. If you reverse the direction of the conventional current, the magnetic field lines also reverse. 
Okay, so the right-hand rule for straight conductor states that if your right sum is pointing in the direction of conventional current and you curl fingers forward, your curled fingers point in the direction of the magnetic field lines, which is shown here in figure 8b. All right, so this is a magnetic field of a straight conductor. So next, let's have a look at the magnetic field of a current loop. So if we, move, if we make a circular loop from a straight wire and run a current through the wire, the magnetic field will circle around each segment of the loop. The field lines inside the loop create a stronger magnetic field than those on the outside because they are close together. You can still use the right-hand rule for a straight conductor to determine the direction of the magnetic field for a single loop, which is shown here in figure nine. All right, next let's have a look at the magnetic field of a coil or solenoid. A solenoid is a conducting wire wound into a coil. The magnetic field of a solenoid is composed of combined fields of all its loops. The field is strongest inside the coil because the field lines are closer together. The more tightly you wind the coil, the straighter the and closer the field lines become. When the solenoid is loosely wound, field lines within the coil are curved. To determine the direction of the magnetic field in the coil where you must use the right-hand rule for a solenoid, which states that if you coil the fingers of your right hand around the solenoid in the direction of the conventional current, your sum points in the direction of the magnetic field lines in the center of the coil. The magnetic field lines of solenoid look like the field lines of a bar magnet, which is shown here in figure 10. This occurs because the strengths of the field can be added together. Much like the net electric field is a vector sum of all the electric fields. Similarly, in a solenoid, the magnetic field around each segment of the loops corresponds to a straight conductor for that segment. A circular magnetic field forms around a wire at that point of the segment, as you can see from figures 10b and c. Adding all the magnetic fields together gives the resulting magnetic field of solenoid. The magnetic field lines extend through the center of the coil and then loop around the outside. The solenoid has the useful feature that we can switch the current in the wire on and off. Turning the current on and off enables us to control the magnetic field. So applying a current through a solenoid, as described above, causes a solenoid to become an electromagnet. Stronger electromagnets can be made using a solenoid with a magnetic material, such as an iron, nickel, or cobalt within the coil. The effect of this core material is to increase the strength of the magnetic field by aligning the electrons within the core material in such a way as to enhance the magnetic field. Electromagnets have many applications. First, they are used in scrap metal yards 
to pick up and drop large metal objects such as cars. Second, they can be used in washing machines and dishwashers to regulate the flow of water. Then they can be used in doorbells to put a lever against the bell and release it. Electromagnets also form the central piece of the MRI unit you will read about in the following, um, following parts of this chapter. Okay, so this is end of today's lesson. I'll see you next time.